Hi everyone and welcome to the first ArcSim simulation game tutorial. This is the first of two tutorials for the simulation game. This first tutorial will go over the student simulation game dashboard. So this is basically the student, the student components and tools for, for students to choose and set a model up in Grasshopper for them to run the game. And the second tutorial will be the instructor model settings, the more detailed settings in, in ArcSim for the behind the scenes model setup and results output conversion and visualization. So just for this first tutorial, we'll be looking at this first group of components in the simulation game file. Now, just in terms of file downloads and setup, we will be using the simulation game file, which Grasshopper file, which you can download along with this tutorial. And that will open up this simulation game um, canvas that has the, the student dashboard as well as the instructor dashboard. In order to run the simulation game, in order to use ArcSim and energy modeling in Grasshopper in general, you'll have to download two other type, you have to download two softwares. One is a plugin for Grasshopper called ArcSim and the other is the underlying simulation engine called Energy Plus. And to do that, first you can download ArcSim by going to ArcSim.com and going to the Downloads page of ArcSim.com. And you'll have to register for, uh, for a download after the licensing agreement. Um, I've already registered, but if you haven't, you'll have to register and come up, but you have to input a, a username and password and then also log in again in order to reach this licensing agreement. But once you've done that, you can go and download the ArcSim Energy Modeling Grasshopper plugin and you can go back to the documentation page, installing ArcSim Energy Modeling and it's recommended that you carefully read through and follow these instructions in order to properly install the ArcSim plugin. Now the other software that you'll need for this tutorial is Energy Plus. And so you can Google Energy Plus or you can go to this um, hyperlink. And here you'll be able to download the Energy Plus uh, energy modeling engine that ArcSim runs on. And you'll see here there's a download uh, link to the right. And it's very important that you pay attention to the release of, Ar of Energy Plus that you're using. ArcSim, you have to link the specific release a number for Energy Plus in ArcSim in order for it to run properly and I'll go through that step before running our energy model. You'll see that um, at the time of this tutorial the most current version is uh, of Energy Plus is 8.3. For my tutorial I'll actually be using a slightly earlier version 8.1 and I'll show you where the, those configurations are located. Good so once those, in, those softwares are installed we can go ahead and jump into the simulation game. Just as a, a brief background, the simulation game is a 90 minute activity for students in class to compete to design the most energy efficient basic schematic model of, a, of an office building or of a specific type of building by selecting different envelope and system settings as well as different formal decisions with a, a maximum budget, making sure they don't exceed that budget and making sure that they stay at a target floor area and the students compete to see which building design can yield the lowest energy use or greenhouse gas intensity. In the case of this specific set, uh, setup for the simulation game, we'll be looking at greenhouse gas intensity or carbon intensity. Now let's begin by creating a simple geometry in Rhino and we'll assign, we'll input that into the ArcSim simulation game file and we'll, and we'll assign different user settings uh, for that geometry. And um, I'll go ahead and just make a box that is, um, I'll start at the this, at this zero, zero point, and I'll make a box that is 40 meters wide by 15 meters um, deep by 4 meters tall. And e each simulation game has its own criteria for maximum or for, for target building size. The target building size that I'll use for this game, for this tutorial, is 3,000 square meters. And so since this building, this box that I created is 15 by 40 or 600 square meters, I'll go ahead and copy this five times in order to get a, an overall building area of 3,000 meters, 3,000 square meters. 
So you see here I have a, a five-story tall rectangular volume um, that in total should be 3,000 square meters. And I'll show you how the simulation game can, once we input the geometry and we apply all of our settings, we'll be able to track the current area of our building and make sure that we're on our target of um, 3,000 square meters. And as I, as I mentioned before, we'll also have to be tracking cost. And the, it, the students need to be sure that they are staying within the maximum cost. And in this iteration of the simulation game, we are using MIT dollars and the students' cost for their building must be less than or equal to 50 MIT dollars. And you'll see the costs begin to accrue as we apply our different settings and as we assign our geometry. So you'll see that the first group of inputs in the student game dashboard is geometry. And I zoom in here and you see that the first one is zone geometry. And we have a, a, a quick instructions in a panel next to the, the um, BREP container saying the create a, to create a BREP, for, a BREP for each floor and then right click on this component and set multiple BREPs by selecting all of your geometry. So I will click on the zone geometry um, BREP container and I'll go down and say set multiple BREPs and I will collect all of the BREPs, all of the, the geometry in my model and hit enter. And if I turn the preview on, you'll see that the all of the um, volumes that I created are selected in zone geometry. Now you'll notice that the current area has not been highlighted yet because I still don't have any of my settings assigned. Once I assign all of my settings, then the current area will show up. ArcSim just needs to have all of these selected in order for the model output to actually yield um, some data about that model. And that's why this isn't showing up yet because we haven't selected any inputs. So I can turn that preview back off. And you'll see the next geometry input is actually uh, it's it's for windows but no actions required because th this container has the automated windows no action is necessary if using automated windows so don't set any geometry to this component now th this will contain windows once we apply some settings to the user settings um, specifically the window to wall ratio once we apply a window to wall ratio you'll see that the uh, windows will begin to show up for example if I select 20 here we have our windows um, showing at a 20% window to wall ratio, but uh, um, until we actually select a window to wall ratio, these will be blank. Um, and I'll go over these envelope settings in a second. The next input uh, geometry input that we have in our canvas is custom windows, and you'll see this is optional. Now the, you ha you'll have the option, the students have the option to draw their own windows in their facades. For example, if they wanna have windows only on the south facing facades or windows just on the south and north facades or a specific combination of different sizes and window to wall ratios on different orientations. They could disable the the automated windows by disabling, by using the disable um, button, by, by uh, using the middle mouse button and disabling the automated windows. And then they could assign custom windows by drawing their own windows according to their design and selecting multiple BREPs and applying them to this custom windows container. But for this first pass of my of the tutorial, I won't be using any custom windows. I'll move forward with the automated windows, as you can see. All right, so now let's move on to the envelope and system settings under here, under the user settings group. So I'll begin by just assigning some baseline settings for all these envelope and system settings so that we be can begin to see some to set up our model and to see some of the cost and area uh, inputs or the cost and area kind of status for our model. So I'll go ahead and select, um, you see that for each of these we have different values. I'll, I'll go ahead and select the baseline for each, roof R20. I'll select the wall construction with the base, the baseline wall construction, roof uh, wall R13. I'll select uh, the baseline glazing, which is double argon, and that doesn't have any low E coating that we can experiment with um, later in the tutorial. Um, we'll keep the window to wall ratio at 20 as we had selected and we'll say no shading and then for system settings i will keep the occupancy sensor off and i will select base lighting power density and i'll explain these in in a moment um, i'll select the keep the dimming off and then a base uh, boiler heating direct expansion and air conditioning cooling so you'll see that now that I've selected all of these, we now have our 
um, floor area and MIT dollars or cost kind of tracking. We see that um, as I ex had expected, the area of, of the building is, is tracking right at 3,000 square meters, so that's good. If my design had a different shape and then maybe I was a little bit under or over 3,000, I can go into my model and uh, change the geometry. I could scale it or stretch it or add, add some pieces to it in order to get closer to the target. And you'll see that the, there is some cost associated with what I've created as a baseline, but um, we have quite a bit of budget to still work with because we have up to 50 MIT dollars to, to select. So um, I could, for example, um, change the geometry or I could increase the one to the wall ratio and you'll see that the, the price will begin to, the cost will begin to increase. Um, I could add shading, let's say one meter of shading and you'll see that the cost is also increasing. And the same with these occupancy settings. And um, I will go over these occupancy settings Basically, the, the occupancy sensor basically means that the energy model, the inputs are, are running off of a, an office type of schedule. So the internal gains are running on an office schedule. It, it basically expects that from about 9 to nine to 5 or 9 to 6, the, the space will be occupied and it won't be occupied on the weekends. So the, this occupancy sensor can be thought of as actually more of a vacancy setter, sensor for lighting. So whenever the building is unoccupied, that will indicate that the lights will, will turn off. And for the purposes of this tutorial, it really implies a, a, a lowering of the um, lighting power density. It, it drops the lighting power density by 10%. So the lighting power density it means the, um, the amount of um, watts per square meter, uh, the, the amount of watts of lighting per square meter of building in our, in our project. So the occupancy sensor turning it on will actually reduce that power density by about 10%. That's the way that the model can, can approximate the, um, the presence of occupancy meters or occup occupancy sensors within the space. And so sim similarly, as I mentioned, the, the lighting power density is the amount of watts per square meter of lighting, uh, of lighting power in our building. And we have a baseline value of 11 watts per square meter. And by clicking low, we can drop that down to nine watts per square meter. And that has a cost associated with it as well. Um, dimming now, actually dimming is mimicking the, the presence of a photo sensor um, dimming controls in our, in our project. So that there's a, a sensor in, in the middle of each, of each zone that will look for the presence of solar radiation or, or daylight. And it will turn off the lights or dim the lights down um, with the presence of that, of that daylight. And you'll see that, um, that dimming, turning dimming off will be associated with higher lighting energy consumed and um, putting dim, dimming on will reduce that lighting energy consumption. But again, it has a cost associated with it. I'll leave it off for now. And then lastly, our heating and cooling systems, we can change, uh, we can change our heating and cooling systems between um, boiler, uh, boiler heating and direct expansion air conditioning, um, baseboard or electric heating uh, with direct expansion AC cooling, which is also electric. Or we can run with um, a kind of a ground source heat pump heating and cooling, which runs on electricity, but has a much higher efficiency because we're using the ground as a source for heat, heat um, sink and heat gain. So uh, the, again, the, these different, these different um, heating and cooling systems have different fuel types associated with them and different efficiencies. And so selecting those different types will have an impact on your cost as well as have an impact on your heating and cooling energy consumption. And the students are, are tasked to experiment with these different, these different heating and cooling systems to find the optimum balance between cost and energy efficiency. But I'll leave it for uh, the baseline as um, gas-fired boiler heating and then uh, electric, electric, heat, electric air conditioning for cooling. Great, so um, the next step again, uh, we've already gone over this track area and cost, that these are just two windows that kind of uh, communicate with how we're doing in terms of tracking our, our floor area and our cost for our current iteration. And again, this is just for the current iteration. You'll see that the, then the next step is really just running the simulation. And this is using the Energy Plus, the Energy Plus, Run Energy Plus component in ArcSim, which is located here in this tab for ArcSim. Now, uh, there's a few inputs for this tab. So we have the model, which is actually everything that, all the settings that we've, that we've made, 
um, they all they're all running through these different model setting components and they're coming into this energy plus component here in this model input we don't really have to worry about that the name um, the students can override the name I have it here to, uh, just by default as temp now the students can create a, a, a new name for this um, by calling it whatever that you know whatever they like they can call it um, the name of their group but they should keep the name the same for their run for their 90 minute session and th this will na automatically name all the associated files the energy plus outputs um, for for um, for the simulation game uh, according to this name now you see that the, there's a directory that the, simula the simulation game automatically puts all the files on the C drive, and then this is automatically generated, and it creates a subfolder for every different iteration that the students use. So if I if I navigate to that simulation game folder, C simulation game, you see I've run this already several times. Now for every iteration that the students will make, there will be a new subfolder, and each subfolder will create will contain the different um, different uh, energy plus input and output files. And uh, we will go into this more in the um, instructor settings, but this is for the students to know where all of their individual files are located. And at the end of the simulation game, they can take this entire folder and zip it up and, um, and submit it to their instructor for the evaluation of the results. Now the next, um, you'll see the next input is the EPW file. Now the students will um, be given a, a site for their simulation game. And for this for this tutorial, we're using Phoenix as the site, and the instructor can set a set a file path um, for the location of the of the the weather file for the simulation game. And I can go to my Energy Plus location under Weather Data and select um, an EPW file from this list. Although I've, I'm going to cancel that because I already have Phoenix selected. I have it actually selected for my Diva Weather Data folder. But just, just for, for reference, that is where the, the weather file is being indicated and um, that's where it's located and that's where it's being input into the Energy Plus component. The next, com the next input is actually the run, the run energy model and that is controlled by a button. And I won't press that quite yet. I want to go to the settings for, for Energy Plus. And this again might be a little bit more for the instructor, but I want the students to be aware that you click on settings and you just go to advanced settings. And here's where you want to make sure that your Energy Plus version is matching the, the here in, in ArcSim, what's indicated here as the installation path that that matches the install that the student is using for running Energy Plus. I mentioned before that I'm using Energy Plus volume uh, version 8-1. And that's why I have that energy that that uh, specific installation path, C Energy Plus V8-1-0. Now, if the students installed the most current version, which at the time of this tutorial was version 8-3, they'll want to be sure that this installation path matches that. And it's recommended for the instructor that they, before actually posting the simulation game for the students to use, that they just have this Energy Plus version coordinated with whatever. Energy Plus version is uh, being downloaded by the class. So that just needs to be coordinated with whatever Energy Plus they have on their C drive. So I'll go ahead and press OK. OK, so um, we're actually ready to run the simulation now that we have our geometry set. We have all of our inputs, at least some values for the input set, and we're tracking our area and cost. I can go ahead and click Run. And then a command line will come up. Uh, a DOS window will come up and it'll run, if it's running properly, you'll see a, a monthly kind of iteration for each month in ArcSim running through the different months, getting energy data for, for those months. And so when your simulation, uh, when your simulation is, is done running, you should get two different results graphs. One is an annual graph of, of annual um, carbon intensity for the, for the building iteration. And the other is a monthly graph of energy balance. And so this is a more, uh, more in-depth look at the losses and gains for the specific iteration. Um, things like heat gains from infiltration, from walls and roof, from windows and equipment, and as well as heat losses and, and heating and cooling. So let's look at, for now, let's look at the annual graph, which is a graph that actually will build upon itself each time you run, you make a change to a simulation, each time you make a change to, a, to your building design and you run a simulation, 
the this graph will grow on the x-axis so you'll get you'll get an annual result for every iteration that you create and so you'll be able to see how each iteration is improving on the, the previous in terms of annual carbon intensity and just, in, just to just to be clear about carbon intensity this is taking the the site energy performance of your iteration and converting it to the different um, carbon intensity or, or the kilograms of um, carbon equivalent uh, per meter squared for your building um, according to the type the fuel use that you're using so if you're if in terms of um, electricity it's has a uh, one type of, of carbon conversion as, as versus natural gas if you're using natural gas for heating so these are the the results that you get for this first this first run of uh, of our energy simulation and you'll see that there are four different values for four for and four end uses within this annual graph we have lighting at the bottom and we have a lighting energy a lighting carbon intensity of 21 then we have equipment next followed by heating and then cooling finally and then at the top of the graph we have our our, our total carbon intensity number 79 um, kilograms of carbon uh, equivalent per meter squared and then you'll see at the bottom we have some more information just for reference you'll have recorded your cost this is the, the cost in MIT dollars for this specific iteration you also have the site energy use intensity just so you know you get a sense of what the site energy use intensity is uh, in kilowatt hours per meter squared and this is not converted for any source values so in terms of the source of of the fuel this is really just the site what's being consumed at the site for your specific um, design iteration. And then lastly, you have the iteration number. So you see this is our first iteration, and it's iteration one. And then I'll go over quickly the energy balance graph. Now this graph actually updates for each iteration. It won't build upon itself in the same way that the, that the annual graph does. And um, you'll see that, uh, as I mentioned before, we have um, a list of gains and losses. And uh, for each gain, for each heat gain and each heat loss, we have a, a positive or, or a negative value of kilowatt hours per meter squared. And um, this could be useful for honing in on specific specific components of our building that we might want to look at more more closely. For example, heat gains from windows is, is a huge picture. This is the sort of the, the middle uh, magenta. You'll see it's, it's this middle one here that is always the largest for each of the months, especially in the summer months here in the middle. These are the months in the x-axis and the energy use intensity positive in y-axis and negative in the, in, the, in the negative y-axis. And you'll see that the heat gains from windows are, are a major player for each of uh, the months, especially in the summer. And we see that the total is 104 kilowatt hours per meter squared, which is much larger than the other components. And you see that to offset that, the zone sensible cooling has to be extremely high, 167.9 kilowatt hours per square meter. And if I go back to my graph, you'll see that that is this um, this component in green. And you'll see that this this is a sort of mirror graph. The heat gains must equal the heat losses. And so, in order to maintain the balance point temperature, the a comfortable temperature inside the the space, the heat the the sensible cooling has to be so um, so high in order to offset the, all of the heat gains. And the heat gains are especially high uh, as a result of the transmission through the windows. Um, solar radiation through the windows, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, that can be helpful in terms of understanding which, what are some of the components that we might want to tweak in order to have a better performance for carbon intensity um, for, our, for our subsequent in, um, iterations. And so one idea would be, as I go back and I make a ne my next iteration for this model, um, would be to improve the windows. I might also want to change some of the geometry. I might want to make this building um, skinnier, but, uh, or, or let's say taller or skinnier, or change the shape, change the orientation. But for now, I'll just focus in on some of these um, user settings. And I hope for the students in the simulation game to experiment with different forms um, looking at self-shading, looking at different types of strategies for that are appropriate for their specific climate. In this case, I'm um, in a very hot and arid climate, which would have a different set of strategies, um, such as self-shading and, and slenderness, that might be useful for this climate. But if we were looking at, let's say, a colder climate like Boston or, or um, in the Midwest, we might want to look at um, strategies of compactness 
and lower window to wall ratios in order to um, maximize the the um, the, uh, the heating efficiency for for our building. Here, we're, it's really more about strategies for overcoming our heat gains and our cooling. So I'll go ahead and go back to my envelope settings, and as discussed, I will change the glazing to a higher performing glazing. I'll go ahead and say, why not? Let's just go ahead and pick this low E on the outside with low solar heat gain. And you'll see that my cost jumped up from, I had it actually at 17 before, and now it jumped up all the way to 41 because I have quite a bit amount of glass. Um, and that I'm jumping from my baseline glazing to a, a, a high quality glazing for a, a large amount of surface area. And so that's gonna represent a good amount of cost. And so let's just see, just for that one specific um, component, that one, that one setting change, what that will, what that will um, amount to in terms of our performance for greenhouse gas intensity. So I'll go ahead and run the simulation once more, and you'll see that the simulation game creates a new directory, a new subdirectory. Where after I click this button, it's going to actually save the Energy Plus outputs to um, a new folder, and you'll see that it created now an updated, uh, an updated carbon intensity, um, annual carbon intensity graph for that second iteration. You'll see that my carbon intensity went down by seven points. As expected, the cooling went down because now I have fewer heat gains coming in from uh, as uh, solar gains from the windows. I still have gains in terms of a lot of internal gains because this is an office. There's a lot of computers and people inside. And so that's why the cooling can only be brought down so much by um, the, the improvement of the glazing. And you'll see that really not, not much of the other components have changed. My lighting hasn't changed because um, I really didn't change the amount of, of, uh, of glazing. And I also, ha as you remember, I have dimming turned off. So the, the lighting isn't really responding to the amount of light inside the space. My equipment is always going to be expected to stay the same because uh, I'm not changing the, the floor area. My floor area is at a target 3,000 square meters, so I want that to stay the same. And you see that the heating changed, but the heating for this climate in Phoenix is really negligible, and so I'm not as concerned about that. And now if I go back to my, my monthly um, energy balance graph, I'll look at the heat gains from windows, and I remember from before this number was over 100, and I've now... Um, effectively reduced that by quite a bit, almost by half. Now it's at 66, and my zone sensible cooling has gone down a bit in or, um, as a result, although you'll see that, that there's still a lot of cooling because of all the internal gains um, in my space. So I, I, I encourage the students then to make different experiments with changing the form and um, orientation, massing, playing with different window sizes that's appropriate for the climate, and looking perhaps at different types of shading strategies in addition to all of these um, user settings for the systems as well as materials to, to really lower this um, carbon uh, intensity as they move forward. And lastly, I'll show the students when they're, when they're finished with the game, the, the last step is really to bake these results, to bake these, these um, annual carbon use intensity results. And to do that, you, the students just need to select all of these components, which are basically the color keys and the bar values and so forth, for all of these different iterations, and that will bring it into the Rhino space. Because actually right now, this is really just a preview in, in Grasshopper. I can't select any of these values because they're really just being previewed from Grasshopper into the Rhino viewport. They're not actually in the space until I bake them. So the way to do it is just to select all these results. Once I selected all of these components, I can middle click and say bake. And what that will do is that will bake that will bake the the all of these results into the cur whatever current layer you have in Rhino. I have my layers hidden right here, but um, you'll see that my current layer is default. So it brings all of these items, all of these annual um, energy uh, use intensity, excuse me, or a carbon intensity graph uh, results into that default layer. And so now you can see that I can move it. Um, and I can save it um, elsewhere in my, in my model for future use. And you'll see that it's empty because I'm in wireframe mode. But once I change to shaded mode, you'll see that those colors come back up, or ghosted mode, for example. And so this is the last step. You, you'll have to just save all these, bake all these results into your file and save your Rhino file. Um, and then the instructor will ask you to um, take take this file with your Grasshopper file, as well as all of, the, all of those results 
that were um, located in your C simulation game and zip them all up together and submit them with your final iteration. Great. That wraps up the first simulation, ArcSim simulation game tutorial. Um, I uh, encourage students to really have fun with their designs, not, not forgetting the importance of formal strategies and decisions in the design, um, design process and decision-making process. The user settings are, of course, incredibly important, um, but it's really the uh, applying the kind of formal and design strategies that are appropriate for the climate in order to really optimize for carbon intensity and for energy use intensity. It's really that, that optimal balance between the, the formal decisions and the settings that will really push the envelope on getting the lowest carbon use intensity for the student's iteration. Thank you, and um, I look forward to the next tutorial.